everyone. Um, I'm Yu Xiang. I'm a professor in UC Santa Barbara. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, our recent work um, on privacy amplification um, and drainage differential privacy. Okay, so this is joint work with Boja and Shiva. Um, I believe they are, they're, they're both here. So, um, so, so what I'm going to do. Um, so, so I'm going to first um, I'll give a little bit of a, a historical view about this problem and motivate like why 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 the hacker we care about um, uh, um, rainy differential privacy and and uh, uh, privacy amplification by subsampling in this setting. And then I'm gonna um, talk uh, uh, talk about our results on um, uh, what can we say about the subsampled mechanisms uh, under the framework of rainy differential privacy. I'm gonna then. Um, um, provide a, 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 a number of experiments to illustrate why this is useful, why this is something that you really wanted to, to do in practice uh, to save privacy budget or to squeeze the last bit of accuracy out of your, your, your system. Um, and since this is a Simon Institute workshop, um, I'm also going to be talking about proofs. Um, uh, hopefully some of the ideas in the proof and some of the things that, that we, we run into uh, might be useful in other contexts as well. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll conclude with open problems and, and maybe talk about a more recent work um, on the different sampling model uh, that, that we, we, recent, uh, we recently finished. All right, so um, um, first of all, um, um, since this is a privacy workshop, um, we every talk start by talking about the definition of epsilon differential, uh, differential privacy. So, um, so, so this is one way to, to look at it. Uh, suppose you have two data sets that differs by uh, just one data point. Um, so in, in this case, you should uh, think about replacing one of your uh, uh, data points in the data set with some, some, someone else. Um, and then there is a randomized algorithm M that's generating the output given this data set. Okay. So, so the log um, probability ratio or the density ratio, suppose you can show that it is upper bounded uniformly for any pair of data sets and any, uh, any pair of adjacent data sets and any possible op output is upper bounded by, by a single number epsilon, then we call it epsilon differentially private. So, so, um, so this is a one number summary of, uh, um, of the privacy guarantee. So, so, so we, we call this quantity the, the, the uh, privacy loss random variable. And, and you, can, um, you can make it a, a two number summary by including another number delta. So you have epsilon delta differential privacy um, where you are uh, you're allowed to uh, ignore a, a small probability of failure. Um, but the thing is that uh, this epsilon characterization of uh, this privacy guarantee doesn't have anything to do with a specific randomized algorithms that you use. So potentially for different algorithms, um, if you look at the probability distribution of this privacy loss random variable, it can potentially be very different. So there might be something that we can exploit um, uh, if we consider a more fine-grained algorithm-specific analysis of differential privacy. So, so, so that's, um, that, that's what a lot of um, um, people have, have done in the past decade. Uh, the most recent, one of the most recent one is a rainy differential privacy uh, framework uh, by Ilya. Um, so, so instead of using um, a uniform upper bound of the, the privacy loss random variable, um, like, like Ilya defined um, this uh, a rainy, rainy divergence measure of, uh, of that. You can, you can think about this as uh, some transformation of the moment generating function. Um, of, of the privacy loss random variable. Okay, and for every order of this rainy divergence alpha, uh, you have a different, um, potentially a different, different upper bound here. So, so in this talk, I'm gonna take a more functional point of view of rainy differential privacy. So whenever I talk about rainy DP, it's not about a specific alpha and this corresponding privacy, uh, uh, this epsilon value. It is about epsilon as a function um, of alpha. Okay, so this is obviously closely related to other development in concentrated differential privacy um, by, by Dworkin, Roseblum, and, and Juan Stanke. 
um, there are different variants, and the most recent one uh, also uh, deals with truncation. So there's this uh, generalization of the CDP framework that works a little bit more with subsampling. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when we get to our results. Um, so, so one of the reasons why people should care about drain EDP is, is that it is in some sense a natural kind of divergence measure for dealing with composition. Okay, so, um, so it composes um, very much like the, the pure DP. So it composes linearly. Suppose you have like uh, two random uh, randomized algorithms that access the data, and and the and them together, the, the corresponding drain EDP uh, function would be simply the sum of the drain EDP uh, function uh, individually. Okay, and this can be an adaptive composition uh, uh, as well as non-adaptive composition. Um, another uh, use case of ring EDP is that it's closely related to epsilon delta differential privacy uh, in the sense that suppose you just compose this for many, many rounds, and, and after the fact, uh, you decided that you want to... Um, um, you are interested to have an epsilon delta interpretation of the, the, the privacy guarantee that's given to you by, by this sequence of randomized algorithm. Then you choose your favorite delta or your favorite epsilon, and, and, and there are standard ways that you can use the tail bound to uh, concentration inequality to calculate the corresponding best possible epsilon or the best possible delta when, when the other parameter uh, is fixed um, in, in, um, by, by, by the user. So comparing to um, the standard advanced composition um, in epsilon delta differential privacy, the obvious benefit is that this is much, much cleaner. Because um, um, you don't have to specify um, a particular pair of epsilon i and delta i parameter for every iteration. And you also do not have to, um, um, to, 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 to like use, say, uh, the KOV kind of approach to um, use more computation to calculate the, the supposedly sharply hard, uh, uh, sharply complete um, optimal composition of epsilon delta differential privacy. Um, and and toward, at the end of the day, since we're not really dealing with just two number characterization of algorithm, we can potentially take into account of specific uh, uh, properties of each individual uh, privacy a randomized algorithm and come up with algorithm specific composition that often gives you an edge over the standard optimal composition uh, for epsilon delta differential privacy. So there's an increasing list of mechanisms where we know uh, how to calculate a ring differential privacy. This include the, the standard Gaussian mechanism, which uh, the, the expression is extremely clean. Um, and the Laplace mechanism, randomized responses, and so on. Um, and all these, like although these are complicated looking, but they are very easily evaluatable in the, in the machines. So, um, and, and this gives you very precise uh, calculations of the, uh, of, of the ring divergence. There are many other uh, differentially private mechanisms, including anything, almost any, uh, everything that, that's coming from the exponential family distribution, including posterior sampling and, and, and other um, things that might, might come up in the statistical estimation and learning problems. Um, and, and their ring EDP calculations are usually available in closed form. However, this is still not satisfactory considering how flexible and how um, powerful these uh, generic tools uh, that has been developed over the, uh, over the past uh, decade in, in the pure and approximate differential privacy world. For instance, I, I have no idea how I can do RAIN EDP for the sparse vector technique. I have no idea how I can replicate the same kind of uh, uh, um, like ex exponential mechanism in general, or uh, or the, the kind of selection problem that that Kuna will be talking about next. So 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 suppose we really think that RDP is a framework that we'd like to endorse. There are a long way to go before we can fully um, convert to RDP and make use of it to to do the same kind of analytic calculation and algorithm design in the same way. That, that we've been doing with epsilon and epsilon delta differential parameters. Yes. 
So for sparse vector, unless I'm forgetting something, is it so? Uh, isn't it just composition of something that that's, that's epsilon differentially private? So couldn't you use that to get the RDP bounds? Um, yeah. Um, it, it depends on whether you wanna. Um, it like there there are different variants of sparse vector technique. It, it depends on whether you also wanna output the out, output the coordinate. Um, so suppose this everything follows from from post processing and is a composition of the Laplace mechanism. Then sure, you can you can handle that using. And I guess also just pure DP implies a certain RDP bound, and right, 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 right. Yeah, the the, the pure DP pure DP will imply RDP with a with an upper bound on uh, everything, so you can track that. But that's that's possibly not tight for the particular algorithm that you use. Okay. So, so, so one particular um, set of techniques that we are going to be talking about in this talk is called the subsampled randomized um, algorithms. So, so it, it goes like uh, the following. Suppose you have this data set, and, and you somehow randomly pick a subset um, of uh, randomly pick a subset of this data set, and then you run a, a randomized algorithm on this. Um, to, to produce some kind of output. So at the end of the day, um, we're only releasing this output, uh, not the, the assignment of, uh, of, of, of which subset got picked. We're only releasing the final output to the adversary or to the, to, to the public. We'll denote this by the, this function composition. So, so you have a data that's coming in, you first sample that, and then you pass it through a different randomized algorithm. Okay, so th this could be the, the differentially private um, mechanism. So, so why, why, why do we care? So one of the reasons um, um, is one of the mo more common use cases for, for the subsampled uh, uh, for, for the, for the uh, sub subsampled uh, randomized algorithm is the following this noisy SGD algorithm. So, so for those who are familiar with machine learning, so this is simply doing gradient this stochastic gradient descent by, by first choose a random mini batch, uh, calculate the corresponding stochastic gradient, uh, clip the uh, individual stochastic gradient corresponding to every individual if necessary, um, add uh, the uh, calibrate the noise according to that sensitivity so that you get um, 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 differential privacy for every in, uh, iteration. And then you use uh, the one's composition um, um, over the, the entire course of training, and at the end of the day, you get something that's, that's, that's pretty good. And for the convex case in particular, when this uh, size of the mini batch is chosen to be one, you actually, uh, in expectation, recover the information theoretic limit uh, for, uh, for, for, for learning the class of problems. And, and this is also the workhorse for, for um, more than differentially private deep learning. Um, and, and it is really the, 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 the recent work by uh, Abadi et al. that um, performed the, the rainy DP analysis that actually makes this practical, that actually um, uh, demonstrates that you can train a deep neural network um, on some like toy examples like MNIS and get a pretty, pretty reasonable accuracy. And, and this is essentially what, what people are doing like all, all the time in, the pra uh, in, the, in, in, in practice as well. But um, the thing is that the RDP analysis for, for, for this subsampled Gaussian mechanism um, like it, it's really something that you need to, to, to work out for every um, mechanism separately. It's, it's not something that, that you can just, um, just assume uh, that, that you, you have uh, you have this uh, this mechanism, and, and you can you can already readily calculate the RDP of the subsampled version of, of those algorithms. And for this algorithm to work, a subsampling is is in fact essential. Otherwise, you won't be able to compose nearly as many iterations to get you to a reasonable solution. There are many potential use cases for subsampling in algorithm design. In particular, um, in machine learning. Uh, People do bagging and random forest all the time, and, and this involves sampling the, the data, sampling the, the corresponding coordinates. Um, and and in, in frequentist statistics, people do 
a statistical inference um, with with bootstrapping, with uh, with uh, subsampling bootstrapping, with jackknife, and in all of these cases, you perform um, some kind of uh, uh, st a statistical estimation or or apply some function on a randomly chosen subset. So the kind of subsample uh, mechanism actually works really well with with these type of uh, applications. So so so. I, I'm sure people have thought about developing uh, differentially private algorithms for, 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 for these use cases. But do we, do we just have to do this on a case-by-case -case basis? Like, can we, can, can we say something more general? And can we, um, for instance, so, so suppose instead of adding Gaussian noise, suppose we want to add Laplace noise. Um, or suppose we want to use randomized responses for a randomly chosen data point. Um, do we have to just do the calculation uh, again for every uh, method separately? And there are a, a gazillion, like many other approaches you can achieve differential privacy. And, and, and chances are you don't want to do it every time you have to, 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 to write a new paper about it. So um, in in, in the setting of epsilon differential privacy and epsilon delta differential privacy, uh, the answer is that you actually don't. So there's this generic amplification lemma uh, that, uh, that says that if this uh, randomized algorithm satisfies epsilon uh, delta differential privacy, then the subsampled version of it satisfy uh, uh, epsilon prime, delta prime differential privacy with delta. That's just uh, gamma times uh, uh, the original uh, failure probability. And with epsilon being equal to something that, that looks like this. So, so, so just do the mental calculation when this gamma is somewhat small, when this epsilon is not too big, um, and, and you, you can, the linearized version of this log is uh, about, about the same. So you get on the order of gamma times epsilon, and you get the corresponding amplification in, uh, through, through, through subsampling. <coughs> So, so this, this was first seen uh, in a work by, by Shiva uh, and, and Adam and, and a few others. Um, and, and later, um, like this was also used as a fundamental theoretical tool for understanding the, uh, uh, the problem of differentially private learning, uh, either for uh, characterizing the learnability or to characterizing the, the, the rate uh, uh, in, in specific learning problems. So uh, more, more recently, um, like this version of the subsampling lemma is actually uh, is actually uh, uh, more more recent. I, I think um, for for sampling with uh, without replacement, and the, the first time this appeared, I think it was in, in John Allman's lecture notes, um, and and then like there is a very interesting, uh, a very elaborate treatment by Boja, uh, uh, Giles, and Marco uh, at NIPS last year uh, that. That says basically for, for, for many different sampling schemes, you get exactly the same, same type of bond. And, and this is also, also optimal. So, so the problem about epsilon delta differential privacy uh, amplification lemma is completely resolved. So, this talk is about uh, how do we do about the same thing for the Rainy differential privacy? Okay, can we come up with a generic amplification bond? Uh, so that uh, if we input um, a, a RDP function corresponding to the, to the mechanism M, uh, can we state analytically what's the corresponding uh, RDP uh, for the subsampled mechanism? So if we can do this, then we can handle many different types of uh, 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 algorithm where we do have the exact RDP calculation um, and, and we have essentially a, a new set of very practical tool in our uh, differentially private algorithm um, algorithm design um, uh, toolbox. Okay. And it's, so I, I, I'd like to uh, mention that um, a, a big part of this work uh, is to actually get explicit consent and to get a constant to be as tight as possible. So because just put it in a blanket statement that in differential privacy, constant actually matters, and constant matters um, a lot in practice. So, so, so there are typically two different types of subsampling that has been considered. 
Uh, one is called sampling without, uh, without replacement. So essentially, this is uh, like you consider a data set of size n, and you consider the replace one version of the differential privacy, and uh, uh, in other words, this n is public information. Uh, you set this parameter m, and then you pick, you, you, you pick at random a random subset of a size m. On the other hand, a more typically studied uh, regime is called Poisson sampling. So in this case, every data point um, tells an independent coin, uh, coin uh, with a certain probability to decide whether it got included in the, uh, in the data set uh, or not. So, so, so the Poisson sampling, uh, when, when this sampling probability is the same for every data point, this is equivalent to first uh, sample of, uh, M from this binomial distribution, then, then sample without uh, replacement. So it's like a smoother version of the sampling, sampling without re replacement. And, and what's, what's typical uh, um, uh, about the se second approach is that it goes really well with the add remove version of the, the original version of differential privacy rather than replace one version. So, so in this talk, um, I'm, I'm going to focus on sampling without replacement. And only until the very end, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the Poisson sampling case and how um, the, the kind of results that we are able to, uh, to obtain uh, is, is different from sampling with, without replacement. <coughs> OK. So, um, so first, let, let, let me. Um, Talk, talk a little bit about uh, uh, intuition, about how, how should we make sense of this problem and, 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 and why this problem is, is challenging. It's not ready, readily so, uh, solvable using uh, standard uh, techniques. Okay, so, so, so recall that uh, we have a, a two-step procedure. We first subsample, uh, finding a random subset, and then say, uh, suppose we, we use Gaussian noise adding, uh, then we add noise to the corresponding statistics calculated uh, using just the subset. So, so let, let's pick a particular x, x prime, okay? Um, let's subsample that and find a particular x prime. And then condition on that chosen subset, uh, this is where this fx prime is. And then you add noise. This, this is essentially sampling from um, the, the, the Gaussian distribution. Suppose you get a different um, uh, sub subsample, then you get uh, um, you, you get a different mean of of this uh, of this of this subsequent noise adding, and 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 this is where where you are. And and since this is subsampling, you have a combina combinatorial many um, uh, centers that, that you add noise from. So at the end of the day, you have many many such uh, uh, Gaussian. So at the end of the day, this is essentially a mixture of Gaussian distribution. Okay, so, 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 so the key idea why amplification is possible is because, um, it's because when, you, when you change your uh, data set from, uh, from x to something that differs by exactly just one, one row, um, then only on a very small fraction uh, of, of these subsets would, would these distributions be different. So in, in particular, um, maybe like, uh, in this subset, this additional perturbation got included uh, in the subsample. In all the others, they are not. Uh, so then, then only a, a small number of such mixture components actually got, uh, got changed. So because of that, um, there are things that we can hope to do, and that there, are, um, the, there are amplification effects that we can hope to, to, to achieve. Okay, more, more generally, in, uh, besides noise adding, uh, so, so you can think about this as just a mean of your uh, arbitrary randomized algorithm, and this index be the chosen, uh, index to the chosen subset. Okay, so, so the main technical result um, of, of our work is um, an upper bound that says that if M obeys epsilon alpha rainy differential privacy for, for all alpha, then the corresponding uh, subsampled version of this, uh, this algorithm uh, satisfy a rainy, uh, rainy differential privacy guarantee that, that looks like that. So this complicated looking uh, bond uh, um, is um, 
like let's let, let's try to parse it a little bit. So so you have this one over alpha minus one that's coming from the definition of Ren Yi divergence. You have this log one plus something that that re also resembles the epsilon delta uh, amplification results. Uh, note note that the first term here uh, there there isn't a term that depends on gamma. So so so, so that term goes away and you start with gamma square. Um, and, and you start with a second order uh, uh, RDP, um, which is uh, uh, about, about the same as uh, uh, isomorphic to the chi-square chi distribution. And, and you have something that suppose gamma is small and suppose this is uh, not, not too crazy, um, uh, you have something that's, that's uh, uh, more or less bounded. You have a, a residual term that's on the order of O uh, gamma, gamma cube. Gamma was the sampling fraction? Yeah, gamma, um, gamma is m over n, so it's a, a sampling fraction. Okay. Um, there, there's, a, uh, there's a lower bound um, that we can, uh, we can construct that, uh, that essentially says that up to an additive factor and up to, uh, uh, up to a, a multiplicative factor that, that, uh, that's on the order of 1 over 1 minus gamma to the power of j, um, like these two bonds actually match, uh, they match uh, term by term uh, up, to, uh, up to a constant. But, but that's, that's not really what we want. So, so let's not try to stare at this bond for too long to try to make sense of that. Let's, let's just plot it. Let's just, uh, for, for, examples of, uh, uh, for examples of M, let's just plot that and see how far away these this upper and lower bounds are, okay? So, so suppose we plot the subsample uh, Gaussian mechanisms, the Ren Yi uh, uh, RDP function on, uh, here. Um, so this blue line um, describes the, the upper bound. So, so it's a weird looking shape. So it starts with a, 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 slow, a, a slow increase, uh, almost like a linear increase. Um, so by the way, this is lock lock plot on the horizontal axis that has the RDP order alpha. On the vertical axis, um, we, we, we have the, uh, the ring DP's epsilon uh, value corresponding to that alpha. And, and we can see that um, in this case, upper and lower bounds in this regime, they differ uh, by, by a fixed constant. And, and on the other regime, so after this uh, point of phase transition, uh, it becomes much bigger, and then the two bounds are essentially uh, identical. Okay. Uh, just ignore the Gaussian, uh, Gaussian approximation uh, for, for now. Um, and, and suppose we do this for the, for the Laplace um, distribution, La, uh, La, La, Laplace mechanism, then we get something that's similar. Um, well, well let's, let, let, let's take a closer look first. So what, what does this first chunk mean? So this is a chunk when the, when the leading term, this one plus, and this first term that depends on gamma square, is actually uh, the largest among the, 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 everything in the summation. So you end up getting this, uh, uh, this term that's linear, that's almost linear in alpha um, with a, a little bit of log one plus epsilon uh, transformation. Um, and then there's, a, uh, there, there's another uh, regime where like, you don't actually get amplification at all. So you end up getting just a, the standard uh, epsilon of alpha from one single call of this Gaussian mechanism. So, so, so where um, does this phase transition happen? So from our bond, we can just read off that it happens roughly at gamma times alpha star. It happens at alpha star when this equation is approximately true. Okay, so, so for, the, for the Laplace mechanism um, on, on, on the right-hand side, uh, so first of all, we know that from the uh, epsilon dp's amplification result, uh, we know that it's gonna, gonna flatten out eventually. Okay, so, so, so this is a corresponding amplified epsilon differential privacy uh, um, that, that you eventually reach. And before that, you, you, you see the same like linear increase um, as, a, as a function of alpha, all the way up to uh, Say, say 10 to the power of three. So, so, so it, it's interesting to compare this to, to other formalism of uh, trying to deal with the Ren Yi divergence and, and uh, um, kind of characterization for, for, for randomized, uh, uh, randomized algorithm. So 
So these include like the Z CDP and the truncated CDP. Um, so, so Z CDP is basically you're you're trying to use a linear upper bound to uh, to to bound the, the the kind of RDP function like throughout um, throughout the domain. So throughout any alpha. And, and you can see that that wouldn't work very well because you have a, uh, you have a much smaller linear term and there then there's a sudden phase transition there. Suppose you want to fit a uniformly linear curve uh, as an upper bound of the, the RDP parameter, you end up getting something that grows much quicker. Okay, and uh, then TCDP is something that's uh, that, that's more recent. So so you basically ignore the part when alpha reaches a threshold, and and you set that threshold as part of the parameter of this truncated CDP, and that gives you a more precise calc calculation. But it's also not exactly the same as RDP because it is a linear upper bound, and as we know, um, the kind of bound that we're getting is log one plus epsilon type. Yeah, for for e to the power of epsilon minus one is um, Somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat big, uh, and gamma is somewhat uh, small. Then, uh, then, then this linear bound won't give you um, something that's a good approximation. Um, so, uh, so, so this kind of bound uh, in RDP allow us to uh, come up with data structure, which we call the analytic moment uh, content. So, this is an extension of Abadi et al. So, mo moment content. Um, so, 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 so users can literally just uh, uh, keep track of everything that they've done to the data set and then uh, add the corresponding uh, RDP parameters to this data structure and this is going to keep track, uh, keep, uh, keep track of everything that has happened so far. And, and some, some kind of uh, uh, algorithm uh, can be subsampled. And, and this is going to just take into everything into account uh, at the same time. And then at the end of the day, the user will only have to specify what's, a, well, what's their favorite delta, and then the data structure is going to calculate the corresponding epsilon on their behalf. Um, so, so this, in my opinion, it allows us to automatically uh, uh, calculate the DP's uh, differential privacy's privacy loss uh, for very complex algorithms that people might, might, might think of. Um, so, um, and th this enables RDP analysis for those who do not want to learn the, learn the math. And, and from our discussion uh, throughout the workshop, I think this is one of the very important problems that, that we, should, we should really think about to help, to help the practitioners. Now, um, Can I ask a quick question? Yes. I think I missed something. What, what is different about this than the moments account that's presented in oh. Abadi 2016? Okay, so, 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 so the main difference is uh, ha have to do with how, how do we deal with subsampling. First of all, with this, we can deal with subsample Laplace, we can deal with subsample other mechanisms. Uh, but but in, uh, in the Abadi at all, um, I guess they can only deal with the subsample Gaussian. And, and secondly, uh, we keep track of everything at, in, uh, in analytical form. So you implement a lambda function, you keep track of that lambda function, you check whether this lambda function has appeared before in a hash table, so you don't have to, to, to save that for every, uh, every time you compose. Um, so, so, so this is just a little bit more, more, more general. Yeah, but the idea um, comes directly from Abadi et al. Okay. So, so suppose we just uh, to just plug this into the uh, uh, the, the, uh, the setting where we need to compose over many many subsample uh, mechanisms. Uh, here are the kind of results that we're getting. So, so we uh, so so on both these two plots on the left, I'm doing uh, composing over many many subsample Gaussian. On the, on the right, I'm composing over many many uh, uh, subsample Gaussian with just a much smaller uh, noise uh, noise level. So, so I'm comparing with, uh, with two baselines. The, the, the purple line is just a naive composition where you simply add up epsilon and deltas. And this green line is something that's slightly more complicated. So, so it is advanced composition and the, the way we calculate that is to first uh, uh, calculate the, the epsilon and delta by choosing a delta parameter. Uh, of the base mechanism, we use the epsilon delta amplification lemma to get the subsampled version, and then we plug that into the the, the optimal com uh, composition uh, by by Kairos et al. Okay. 
At the end of the day, uh, we also optimize over the initial delta that we choose so that we can get the smallest possible uh, uh, epsilon for the, for the desired uh, delta, which is equal to uh, 10 to the power of minus 8. Okay, so, so this is really like uh, the, the, uh, the best that we can do with using just epsilon delta differential privacy. Okay, so as we can see, uh, as we keep composing over the number of rounds of subsample Gaussian mechanisms, um, this is significantly bigger, like by an order of magnitude than our upper bound, um, and a little bit uh, even even bigger than the than, than, than the lower bound. And and. And, and suppose we uh, just add a much smaller amount of noise for every base mechanism, then, uh, then, then the gap becomes more and more drastic. Okay, so, so, so the KOV, like for the choice of delta and epsilon combinations, it doesn't actually, for any parameter, it doesn't actually give us um, the right kind of dependence uh, uh, for, for this setting. But what's, what's curious is, uh, is, is why do we see this flattened curve here? So, so in, in certain regimes, when we do not compose enough, um, um, when we actually want a very small uh, epsilon from the epsilon delta differential privacy, then, uh, then the Rainy DP framework is actually significantly outperformed by the more naive approach uh, of, of simply adding up epsilon and delta. Okay, so, so, so th this, is, this is because um, uh, this is because in that setting, um, thanks to this phase transition of this Gaussian RDP, um, so throughout these, the optimal alpha that, that got chosen to calculate this epsilon and delta is actually picked at that kinky point. So, so beyond that, you, you are, you're not able to significantly drive the epsilon down um, by, 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 by large margin. So, so that, that's why uh, RDP, it, um, like it's, it's really helpful when you, when you compose over many, many rounds of uh, uh, composition, but, but not, not always. It's not always gonna, gonna outperform the baseline. Suppose we um, do subsample Laplace. Uh, we get something that is similar, although we get rid of that artifact uh, because Laplace has, a, has an upper bound um, um, as, as alpha goes to infinity. Um, that's why we get something that's, that's, that looks much better here. And you would think that um, the epsilon Delta or the epsilon DP cal uh, calculation for the Laplace mechanism is already like very tight and very precise, but you still get uh, some kind of a constant improvement by uh, uh, applying the moment, moments account. This is with a certain choice of alpha. Um, this is with a uh, with a fixed delta. Alpha. Um, uh, no. So so the. So for, for every single point like this, you actually choose the best alpha to give you the smallest possible epsilon. Okay. All right. So so um, so 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 I'll spend the remainder of the time uh, talking about proofs. So I'll, I'll go a little bit quicker because because uh, I'm I'm running out of time. So so the idea of the proof is to um, is to actually take the Rainy DP uh, to a different domain called the ternary. Uh, pearson vashta divergence uh, domain. And then we define something called a ternary pearson vashta di di uh, uh, different differential privacy. So this is something that only com comes up due to technical reasons. So, 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 so don't think about this as a brand new privacy definition. But the, the good thing about this is that in this domain, it is much easier to, to talk about amplification. So you get an extremely clean uh, amplification lemma for this kind of definition of, of differential privacy. So, so what we did was to, um, to convert this RDP for this composed mechanism to uh, its corresponding ternary uh, pearson vashta divergence uh, um, version of, uh, of privacy definition, amplify that, and then use the RDP of the base mechanism to upper bound um, the, the, uh, the ternary uh, pearson vashta divergence of the, uh, um, of the base mechanism themselves. So, so that's, that, that's a big picture how the proof works. So a short detour to the, to the divergences. People should be familiar with this. You have Rainy divergence. And for different choices of alpha, you get something that you are familiar with. You get Hellinger distance. You get tail divergence when you take alpha uh, at the limit to, to 1. And, and you get something that's very similar to, to chi-square divergence when you take alpha equals to 2. <coughs> And, and, and in general, when you have a convex function f, you can define a f divergence like, uh, like that. 
Um, and and what, what, what is Pearson Bachelor divergence? You can think about it as a generalization of the chi square divergence by uh, increasing the power to, to an arbitrary uh, integer L. Um, and, and since this is not always a divergence, because when L is uh, uh, when, when L is, is an odd number, so this is not really a convex function. So, so people also define the absolute version of the Pearson Rothschild divergence. Okay, so that, that's what, what we're going to be using. And, and it's, it's, it has interesting connection to the, to, to the privacy random variable, because suppose you uh, put the moment generating function of the privacy random variable here, if you take derivatives uh, of alpha order and assign that to zero, you recover the moments of the, the, the privacy random variable. But suppose you take the discrete derivative here, you get the linearized version of this, uh, you get the moments of the linearized version of the privacy loss random variable. <coughs> so, um, so, so this is how a ternary version of the uh, 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 high absolute value alpha divergence is defined. Um, so instead of having just two distributions, so now we have three distributions in, in this divergence measure. So this is not typical. This is again something that comes out of our analysis quite naturally. So, so um, um, the, and, and these distributions are assumed to be mutually adjacent. They're coming from mutually adjacent data sets. For instance, uh, in this case, uh, all the other um, people in this data set are the same except for the, for the last one. Okay, but we have, we have three of them. Um, and, and this is implied by the definition of mutual adjacency because uh, um, um, if you require them to be adjacent by a distance function of one, then this implies that for these three distributions, uh, the coordinates or the, the location where you make that change needs to be identical. Otherwise, you have, a, you have a distance of two. And, and when you take the supremum over all possible data sets, you, you, you get the corresponding definition of, uh, uh, of, of a pearson that uh, differential privacy. Um, we, we, just for normalization purposes, we, we take a, a one over alpha power here. Okay, and similarly, we can also de define the binary version of, uh, of these. Uh, and, and these are more or less equivalent. The ternary or the binary version of this is DP, DP measure because they are uh, bounded from above and below by a constant factor. Um, and, and, and this proposition shows that um, this notion of privacy is actually uh, very natural to talk about uh, subsampling. Okay, suppose M obeys this uh, Kasai a ternary um, differential privacy. Uh, then the corresponding compose mechanism simply obey um, this, but with just a constant multiplication to this function um, by the sampling probability. So this is saying that, uh, well, uh, it is, like just like the, the ringy differential privacy is natural for composition, the, verge, the Pearson verge dot divergence is really natural for talking about uh, uh, subsampling. And I'll, 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 I'll skip this part of the proof, but the idea is to condition on two events, whether the, the perturbation is included in the data set or not included in the data set. So this, this, these are purely on the index domain. Uh, and, and as we said, for all the three distributions, the corresponding index of that perturbation are the same. So we can do this kind of calculation and then, then gain an additional gamma uh, to the J here. And, and note that the, like all these quantities are still mixture distributions, so we have to somehow deal with that. So, so the idea is that we, we, we need to match them into, uh, into triplets uh, by introducing additional smoothing so that we can match them into triplets. And in every one of those settings, we can upper bound these with just a, a pearson watch that divergence of, of the base mechanism. And the second step would be to bound the RDP with, a, uh, with, with, with this. So, so this is very simple. So you just add one and subtract one, and then you apply binomial expansion, and you end up getting something that, that, that's, that's in the form of uh, uh, the binary uh, pearson watch divergence. Um, and then you can upper bound the, the binary with the ternary, um, since you are maximizing over more things. So you can always, always do this. And then you apply the natural subsampling proposition uh, in the previous slide. You get something like that, OK? And, and the last step, uh, this is a little bit messy. So, so, um, so, so now that you express everything in a, in a form of this, this chi to the power of alpha uh, uh, um, differential privacy, and then you have to convert everything back to, to, to ringy divergence. 
So we have multiple ways of dealing with that. And, and once you substitute all these uh, lemmas and all these different calculations, and then take the, 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 the minimum of all of them, you end up getting the theorem that we, we started with. Okay, so, um, so the lower bound is, is much easier. So, so this is nothing information theoretical. You basically need to construct one particular data set. Um, and and for, for that data set, um, for that data, uh, data set, all the data points are repeated from the first one to n minus one. Um, so suppose you take an arbitrary subset that they, they, they matches exactly. So the mixtures will have the identical center and all the mixture components, most of the mixture components will, have, will be identically distributed. So that, that gives you a, a, a more or less matching lower bound. So, but the, there's still this constant that's really troublesome. Like how, how can we deal with this additional constant factor? Um, like I said, um, constant can be really important for applying differential piracy. And can we, can we somehow close this uh, a little bit more? So, so the conclusion is that for um, subsampling without replacement, there are something we can do, but we need additional assumptions on this mechanism, um, which I'm, I'm going to skip. Um, but for um, this alternative sampling scheme called Poisson sampling, and we can actually ob um, obtain a much more uh, precise result. So, so, so this is essentially just a lower bound that we, we, we were looking at. And that lower bound also applies to the Poisson sampling scheme. Uh, the only difference is that there is a factor of three here. And, and this factor of three can be, um, first of all, this is on the lower order term. And secondly, this factor of three can be removed. Suppose we can check that the odds other um, non-absolute version of the pearson vachelard divergence are always greater than zero, which uh, we, we use a different argument for Gaussian and Laplace mechanism, and we show that it's actually the case. So, um, um, so now we have an exact bound for the Poisson subsampling version of, uh, uh, of Gaussian and Laplace mechanism. And Poisson sampling again is yes, you, you, the, the standard one that, that you're familiar with. You, you pick uh, one data point independently with probability gamma. Okay. As opposed to including like a Poisson number of okay. <laughs> Yeah. It's actually a binomial. Uh, it's equivalent to take the, the yeah. Anyway. Okay. You include each data point independently. Yes, yeah, independently with probability gamma. Um, um, uh, yeah, this was my uh, work with my, stu uh, my, my student, Yu Qing. Um, so you, you may wonder whether this kind of calcula calculation can be done for any mechanism. But unfortunately, the answer is no. So, so from this example by, by Nielsen and Nock, um, even within the exponential family, suppose uh, uh, you compare two Poisson distributions, and the parameters of the Poisson distribution are coming from two adjacent data sets. Um, then you get uh, these, this uh, highly negative uh, um, um, like uh, all, all the other pearson vachelard divergences, which essentially give you a bigger upper bound um, um, than the one that, that we've seen before. So, so this really needs to be, be uh, data dependent. But in the worst case, you actually get a constant factor, um, just a factor of theory on the low order term. Okay, so that, that concludes the talk. Um, and I guess open problems are how do we close a constant gap in, in both settings? And, and how do we exploit the randomness from the data? So if, if, you, if you think about it, um, like this kind of thing are very similar to, to um, kernel density estimation. So chances are, suppose there are in inherent randomness from the data, and with this additional uh, smoothing factor from the additional added noise that we're having, uh, and then we can hope to obtain like more privacy um, when the data is highly varying. Thank you very much. I think we can take only one question. Uh, do you have an example of a mechanism where the generic uh, epsilon differentially private conversion to RDP has a large constant factor overhead over some specific uh, analysis. So if I forget that I use mm -hmm. a Laplace mechanism and I just say, okay, it's half epsilon over, uh, or half epsilon squared, uh, and also cap it, uh, private, the um, or the the gap.
gap between the RDP curves is actually not very big. Yeah, so, so, um, so I guess a subsample Laplace mechanism is an example of that. Um, but, but suppose you want pure DPs and you're not getting anything. You're not, not getting anything more. So, so the kind of results that you get an advantage over the course of composition is only for, for epsilon delta. So when alpha goes to infinity, the, the, the calculation of uh, pure DP is tight, and the amplification lemma is also tight. Um, so, so this is just a more refined way of dealing with the cases when you actually don't want a perfect um, pure, pure differential privacy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's thank our speaker. Let's take a short break.